This is Live Well Talk on Influenza. I'm Dr. Dustin Arnold, Chief Medical Officer at UniPoint Health, St. Luke's Hospital, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, it is the flu season, and as we know, last year we had a very mild, if not absent, flu season. And today joining me on the podcast is Dr. Evan Deal, who is Vice President and Medical Director of UniPoint Clinics. And we're going to discuss with him what we're going, what we anticipate, what we are seeing, and, and the difference between influenza and COVID. Welcome back to the podcast, Evan. Thanks for having me, Dustin. Hey, let's start off so far. What are we seeing in the hospital? Yeah, I think uh, so far um, we've been fortunate and have not seen a great uh, amount of influenza this year. Um, I think in November we started seeing our first positive tests. Uh, I understand we only have one positive influenza patient in the hospital right now. They also are hospitalized with COVID, uh, so that's kind of interesting. But uh, we're looking still more at like a handful of positive tests, I think, for patients that are having milder symptoms and being able to manage it at home. You know, the interesting thing is we just we don't know who knows what's going to happen the next few months. And uh, I think we all have a, uh, a bit of concern, you know, that if there is a large number of patients that are getting ill with influenza, how are we going to add that to the capacity you know, of an already stressed out health system? But let's uh, you know pray that, that things aren't as severe and maybe uh, maybe we'll get lucky. So last year, the um, the exact numbers we, we were like 300 cases, then 200 cases, and then 20, and then zero. You know, just precipitously dropped. And usually, it's more of an arc. You know, like you'd expect a bell curve. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? You think it was just all masking and social distancing? Um, it, it's pretty amazing, you know, uh, when you think about it. I, I do think um, we experienced a lot of isolation. You know, you think about like the nursing homes and the hospital, cl clinical care settings where, um, you know, call it masking if you want. That's certainly a big component of it. But that isolation, you know, of knowing to keep distancing and keeping anyone who got the sniffles or anything early, you know, where people are very vigilant in those settings, I think to keep people separated. And I think that's probably the biggest part of it. And um, maybe that's what we need to continue to focus on going forward next, this next year is that, you know, one of the biggest things has to be, if you're sick, you gotta stay home, you know, and, and you gotta be a little bit more vigilant on that than we may have been in the past. Yeah, I think that paradigm's definitely changed for physicians and nurses. I mean, it used to be, okay, if you're mechanically ventilated, you can stay home. Yeah. Otherwise, exactly. you have to come into right. work. Yeah, you know? there's no there's no shame anymore. I think people understand that, you know, yeah. and especially if if you've got a noticeable cough. I mean, it's pretty, I think we all experience this. It's It, it feels pretty uncomfortable to come to cough out in public. You know, you get a lot of leery eyes and think uh, you should be at yeah. home. And yeah. that's probably smart. I think one of the conclusions that I've drawn from last year and how the flu season behaved, that prior to the pandemic or early on in the pandemic, they were making comparisons to influenza. Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't think you can compare influenza and COVID-19. They're two different viruses. They are both respiratory viruses. But I don't think they're this that that you can use one paradigm to approach the other. What's what's your thoughts on that? What what do you see as the differences between the two? Um, clearly, COVID nineteen is you know a higher degree of uh, a higher infection rate, or you're more contagious. Um, you know, I'm the first person to say that I, I've been wrong about a lot of things, and I, I remember sitting on my couch back, you know, when we first heard about COVID, thinking like. You know, we know how bad influenza can be, right? I think from a, a physician or provider standpoint, you're used to seeing, you know, people that get intubated or die, you know, from influenza, and so we know that that's a great, um, a great challenge. And so uh, my initial thoughts were like, yeah, this is going to be pretty similar. You know, that most people have mild symptoms, but elderly or even young children, you know, could get very sick, and even if the you know, mortality rates are in the you know single digit percentage when you have millions and millions of people get that right. That gets to be a pretty big number like it is for influenza every year. Um, I think there's a big difference between something being endemic and pandemic, you know, that perhaps there's going to be um, a difference in the severity of illness 
you know, five to 10 years from now, if one of us catches COVID because we've had it before or something similar, you know, and so we'll have a bit more understanding of that natural course of the disease, especially if people are having secondary infections, um, which is similar to influenza, you know, like I get influenza now and I kind of know what's going to happen or we all remember like, yeah, you have a couple days of fever usually and it's pretty bad, but um, but we know what the course is going to be like um, with with COVID, it's just, uh, again, this is also new. Um, we're still learning about what the course is like for most people, and um, it is hard to compare. I, I agree with that. Yeah, it, it and you know, like you said, the, the, the immunity that will carry over, uh, it will be there from each to other. You know, I, I know of two patients that had COVID twice documented, Real, I mean, it was real, not a persistent positive. I mean, and the second time they were significantly less ill than the first time. Mm -hmm. And so, I, so, so we know there's some circulating immunity that probably carries over. Same with influenza. Yeah. If you, if you think about it in a not technical way, I read something on the CDC's website about the influenza vaccine that just said that every year it helps train your body to help fight off influenza. And I, I kind of, I like that description of it because you know, the influenza vaccine doesn't make you completely immune to it. We know that, right? But it seems like it does help your body train to fight it off. And I think that uh, previous infection from influenza may do the same thing. The same thing for for uh, the SARS-2 coronavirus that we're still learning and our bodies are still training how to fight this off. And, and I think over time, we'll get better at it. Yeah. So I think I've told you this, but uh, I know I've probably mentioned on other podcast but so the spanish flu uh which has the only thing it has to do with spain is that during world war one uh germany and the central powers and the allied powers didn't want to put in their newspaper that they had influenza going through the trenches yeah but spain which was neutral reported so it became the spanish flu yeah. but so they noted that young people died uh disproportionately older people and they thought it was because they had a cytokine storm from the flu virus and they're young and healthy. So they have this, this exaggerated response. But now they've gone back and surmised that there is a pandemic in 1889 That's and right. that, that this immunity carried through. And so the older people had it in 1889 and they had some residual immunity, so they did better. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, I think, I think we're learning more all the time. Obviously, that's the nature of science. But I think we're learning more about immunity and how you can have some memory, uh, even if it doesn't prevent you from getting it. It does prevent you from becoming as ill, yeah, uh, and uh, transmitting it. Influenza and COVID. What are your th What are the similarities and differences as far as physical symptoms? Yeah, you know, you'll see a lot of charts out there trying to describe them. Um, the biggest challenge is that a lot of them overlap. Um, we think of symptoms of respiratory viral infections. So we think of cough, we think of fever, malaise. Um, if you dig down into it, you know, some of the CDC reports will talk about um, gen more generalized fatigue, like severe weakness hitting on might be something that's more with COVID. Um, body aches and, and chills might be something that's more with influenza. Um, but there's a great degree of subjectivity there and clearly some overlap. But, um, you know, cough, I think, is a big one. Fever is what we think of, uh, that generalized weakness and fatigue. Those are the big ones that I think of. You know, we've heard of the anosmia, difficult loss of taste and smell. Uh, I'm not aware of that being part of the influenza. Um, but that usually is something that seems like people notice after the fact, you know, as they're as they got fever and got the diagnosis. So I don't know how helpful that is uh, to catch it initially. Those are the ones that I think of. I don't know if there's any I missed there, Dustin. No, that's that's, you know, that uh, loss of taste and smell. It seems to be pretty um, pathognomonic or, or consistent with COVID compared to other illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, you mentioned I remember when this all started. Um, uh, something about mucus or snot, right? That there didn't seem to be, I think with both of these, we usually don't think about as much the 
profusely runny nose, right. uh, super right. stuffy yeah. nose, and, um, even some sore throat. But that's probably more what we think of a typical seasonal cold. And, and that's an important uh, difference. Um, again, there is some uh, a lot of overlap there as that runny nose might, you know, progress to a cough. And is that going to be influenza? I understand people being concerned about that. But I think if you start with something that's primarily sinus, you know, and and starting up there and then maybe progresses to a cough, that's probably unlikely to be an influenza uh, or COVID in, in my understanding. Uh, I just read an article, a journal somewhere here on my desk, but um, unlike, you know, remember medical school, you learn influenza, staph aureus is the most common yeah. secondary pneumonia yeah. or, or, or seen with that. Strep remains the most common cause of pneumonia, period, but staph with viral infections to so the super infection. And that's what a lot of people die from, mm -hmm. the elderly people. They get a super infection on top of the influenza. Uh, that's as our intensivists have noted in our hospitalists, that's pretty rare with COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, we, they're not getting secondary bacterial infections. Um, yeah, and we've, you know, certainly when the people get critically ill, a lot of times antibiotics seem like a reasonable, you know, maybe there is some underlying bacterial infection we don't know. So I think um, there's been some usage of antibiotics, but not a lot of documented, you know, specific uh, organisms. The uh, the other thing I came across uh, that I found of interest was super spreader events. So th that means one person, I think it's eight, one person infects eight people. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a super spreader event, not seen with influenza. Right. Uh, so if you, you know, that kind of gives it away too, that maybe, right. okay, this might, and we don't see the lymphocytopenia, the thrombocytopenia, the low platelets, low lymphocytes that we saw with uh, in the elevated D-dimer that we right. saw with the, uh, do you, um, you know, you mentioned the super spreader. I still wonder if that comes back to, you know, just some some degree of previous immunity, right? Like that perhaps those people have had some influenza, either exposure in the past or had it in the past. And perhaps that's why, you know, they could be around someone and not contract the disease. It's well, I, I think I think part of it is that influenza is predominantly droplet. And COVID, although. I, I feel it's airborne. I think the evidence that it is airborne is, is I go back to the USS Roosevelt, you know, they could see where sailors were based on the duty log and they had no contact with other people, but yet they got it. So, um, it, it so I think, I think that might be part of it too. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, you wonder like, could it be, could it still be the same degree of being droplet, but just that if you had influenza before what we call yeah. droplet, you could get it, you know, a few of those droplets and really not get infected um, versus if it is just droplet for COVID and it's so infectious that if you get just a little, you know, just a, a few of those uh, virus uh, viruses in your mucosa, that that's enough. Um, it's just it's really hard to confirm that. Yeah, it is super hard to prove that something is actually airborne. Yeah, um, it, and it's really just over time and evidence they can surmise that confidently. Um, it's very difficult to culture something out of the air. With yeah. case what I've read, yeah, I think the 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 concern that reading some of the PhD literature, the immunologist, that what you talked about, how you have some your body is trained to fight off influenza each year, and last year we weren't exposed to influenza. And so there's the risk that we could have a worse flu season because we don't have that carryover immunity that we didn't have it during fall and a normal flu season. Sure. So so that's yet to be seen. Now, the southern hemispheres did fine, um, but they, they they actually had, if you think about it, they had their flu, uh, why they still had a rather high uh, efficacy of the vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're available in January. They're getting them. Um, you know, I, 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 I think I, I think you and I were talking about this the other day that if we didn't own the vaccines would only have. Six months, we would give them in July. Yeah, or, you know, we'll have to figure out what the is there going to be an annual thing? You know, it sounds like there's officially they're saying they think that's unlikely right now. You know, if you get the full series, um, but 
what's the perfect timing? You know, will there be annual changes? I, I think any of that's possible. Wouldn't be surprised. Well, in addition to the uh, flu shot, uh, the vaccine, um, what other things can people do to prevent catching the flu? Yeah, um, I think it's simple things. You know, we talked about just washing our hands in hospital settings. We have the alcohol, um, you know, hand washing stuff, which is fine, but washing your hands as best as you can. Um, staying home when you're sick, you're not feeling well, um, or covering your cough. You know, the polite things that we teach our kids to do, cover our cough and uh, wash our hands, I think are really important. Yeah, I think masks are going to be a big part of our communities and societies for for a large group of people going forward for quite a while. I mean, yeah. you saw what happened after the initial SARS outbreak in the Asian countries that, that culturally became a lot more acceptable. And I think there will be some more of that. Um, you hear people talk about just being right now, they're uncomfortable being in big groups of people, you know, public transit, you know, imagine being on the subway or something like yeah. that. I would understand that, um, you know, wanting to to feel like you're protecting others and wanting to be wearing a mask when this pandemic ends might still continue. Um, but I think it's the simple things. I think it's washing your hands, it's covering your cough, it's staying away, staying away from people when you're sick, um, you know, isolating, staying home, not going to work if you've got a fever and a cough. Um, and uh, just trying to think about each other, right? Again, it's all of this comes back to us trying to protect each other. Um, if if I'm staying home with influenza, you know, normal five to seven days usually is the course of the illness. Um, what else should I do at home? Hydration? Yeah. What? What? That's a that's a great question, and I think it's it's really different for different populations, right? Like, you know, if you're if you're a teenager in your twenties or thirties, you know, it's I think it's really really unlikely if you're healthy to to run into a um, a severe problem from typical influenza. Um, for older folks, I I still I think about and I talk with patients about like, well, what's changed? Have they stopped eating and drinking? You know, like that's a big sign. If you're in bed for two or three days with fever, and all of a sudden you know you're you're sixty plus and you've stopped eating, yeah, you know, that's not a good sign. Right. Um, lethargy, mental status changes in older folks when they're not talking. Um, you know, that's something to be concerned about. And so um, it is important uh, to stay hydrated, especially if you're having a fever, um, you know, your metabolism ramped up, and you're really likely to get dehydrated. But if you have other medical conditions, if you're an older person and you're on a lot of medications, you know, some of those medications like diuretics and things like that, as soon as you throw in a, a wrench, like having a fever and not having your normal fluid and sodium intake, like I think you're at risk for a lot of complications. And that's how yeah. we see people come and get in really, really sick, uh, dehydrated with kidney failure. And so that is something where if I think after a day or two of having a fever, if you're not feeling better, you need to talk to your doctor. Yeah. Um, you know, but if you're if you're a 25 year old who's not on any meds and you're able to get some chicken noodle soup down and feel miserable for a couple of days, but stay in bed, make sure you're drinking. Um, that's something that I think, you know, chances are you'll be fine. Uh, I would say in my 25 years of practice, I, I've seen influenza followed by exacerbations of heart failure as a very common scenario, more so than super pneumonias or, yeah. you know, some degree of COPD exacerbations, but that's really a small sliver of the population. Yeah. Um, it's really that heart failure exacerbation follows influenza. It's been my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just I think it, it can it can really throw a complication in one of those other chronic medical conditions, which is usually well controlled. Or, you know, if you're someone with um, really bad lung disease, bad COPD, uh, clearly that's at risk for causing uh, a big problem with an acute respiratory illness like influenza. Yeah, because some of those patients, it's this far uh, from a good day and a bad day. You know, yeah. just a mild influenza can really push them over. Yeah. Well, before we wrap it up, I'd like to extend